Hello and welcome to episode 21 of Toke Signals TV, where we look at the biggest in cannabis and hemp news stories every week. I'm Steve Elliott, your host. I'm editor of ToteSignals.com, and I'll be guiding you through the news. First, though, let's take a look at our Tote TV Bud Pick of the Week. We have a strain called Grape Stomper OG, which is an Indica Sativa hybrid here. I understand that the Sativa half of the family has some Kim Dog in it. It is just about a 50-50, quite balanced. It may be a 60-40 in Indica's favor. I got this at Top Green Meds at Bremerton, Washington for $10 a gram. Let's do the news, shall we? In Washington State, we had some really good news this week. The Liquor Control Board, if you've been following along, had previously recommended that home growing be taken away from Washington medical marijuana patients as part of the implementation of Recreational Marijuana Legalization Measure I-502. Now, in a major victory for the medical marijuana community, the Washington State Liquor Control Board, under heavy patient pressure, on Wednesday reversed itself, signaling they will recommend the lawmakers that medical marijuana patients continue to be allowed to grow cannabis in their homes. The LCB's previous recommendation that home growing be outlawed in order to force patients to conform to recreational legalization measure I-502 had produced outrage in Washington's medical marijuana community. I-502 is the recreational cannabis legalization measure approved last year by Washington voters. Board members now say they recommend that patients or their designated providers be allowed to grow up to six plants, three flowering and three non-flowering. Currently, patients are allowed to grow up to 15 plants at any stage of growth. Unexplained was why the 15 plant limit, which was reached by the legislature after extensive discussion and consultation with experts, was abandoned. We're all in agreement on home grows, said board chair Sharon Foster of the three-member board. Members on Wednesday worked on changes they would like to make to their recommendations, but they didn't take formal action. A formal recommendation from the board is expected at its meeting next week. The recommendation will reverse a proposal by staff at the Departments of Health and Revenue and the Liquor Control Board to outlaw home growing by patients. Recreational users aren't allowed home growing under I-502. The outlawing of patient home grows was the most controversial recommendation made by the Liquor Control Board. In public comments about the recommendations, keeping home patient grows was the most common request made by 362 people in written requests. And it was also the most common refrain at an emotional public input hearing held in Lacey last month in which more than 600 patients, including myself, packed a room designed to hold 450 people. The patients for more than three hours told members of the Liquor Control Board and the Departments of Health and Revenue why ending home growing, banning patient collective gardens, ending the process through which new conditions can be added to the authorized medical conditions for cannabis, and forcing patients onto a state registry aren't good ideas. Patients and advocates told board members that home growing provides patients with more affordable cannabis and also allows them to have rare medicinal strains they might not be able to find in recreational pot stores. The board still plans to shut down patient collectives. And an additional source of concern is that in some areas, the number of stores will be reduced by more than tenfold if and when dispensaries are shut down. In Seattle, for example, there are currently more than 220 patient collectives in operation. Under I-502, only 21 retail recreational marijuana outlets will be allowed in the city, from 220 to 21. Members will vote next week on recommendations due to the legislature by January the 1st. Lawmakers are tasked with reconciling the heavily taxed and regulated recreational marijuana system created by I-502 legalization with the medical system, which has legally existed since voters approved medicinal cannabis back in 1998. State consultants have publicly admitted that they are concerned that the medical marijuana system will siphon potential customers away from the profit-making recreational system. 
They also claim that the medical marijuana system will deter the I-502 system from its goal of undercutting the illicit market. And that's nonsense because the medical marijuana system isn't illicit. Exchanges of money for marijuana are explicitly allowed under Washington's medical marijuana law, RCW 69.51A. Liquor Control Board members Foster, Ruth Ann Kuros, and Chris Marr appeared on Wednesday to reach agreement on several other recommendations, including requiring a patient registry. And that's also unpopular with patients because they fear the registry will be used to plan law enforcement raids. The board also wants the Department of Health to define intractable pain. That's a common condition for medical marijuana authorizations. And that's in an apparent attempt to reduce the number of authorizations that are being given out. Board members left in place a proposed 25% tax on medical marijuana. It's taxed 25% each at the cultivation, processing, and retail levels. Board member Marr said the tax rate for medical marijuana should be left up to the Department of Revenue and the legislature. The LCB wants to allow only those recreational marijuana stores who get a state endorsement for medical marijuana to serve patients. But state officials haven't yet determined what the criteria would be for such an endorsement. What this means in the real world is that medical marijuana patients will have even fewer safe access points since many or most of the recreational stores might not be endorsed to sell to patients. Now, too bad there's not already an existing system of medical marijuana collectives which specifically exists to serve patients. Oh, wait, there is. But the state has decided that it's bad for profits. In Uruguay this week, marijuana legalization had barely taken place when it was challenged by the United Nations International Narcotics Control Board. The celebration's in full swing down in Uruguay. It became the first nation in modern times to fully legalize cannabis. But a drug agency overseen by the United Nations on Wednesday claimed that the move violates an international treaty on controlled substances. Uruguay is violating 1961's single convention on narcotic drugs, according to the International Narcotics Control Board. That 52-year-old world treaty, the single convention, was designed to limit the possession, use, manufacture, and production of drugs exclusively to medical and scientific purposes. According to the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, the single convention combats drug trafficking through international cooperation. Uruguay this week became the first country since the single convention to create a national marketplace for legal cannabis, with the government controlling the production and sales of marijuana in a bid to stymie the black market. Cannabis is controlled under the 1961 convention, which requires states to limit its use to medical and scientific purposes due to its dependence producing potential, said INCB President Raymond Yans. The INCB is in charge of monitoring enforcement of and compliance with UN drug treaties. The INCB sounds distinctly butthurt that they weren't asked for permission before Uruguay legalized marijuana. The board regrets that the government of Uruguay did not respond to INCB to engage in a dialogue prior to further consideration of the law, Yans said. INCB reiterates its call to the government of Uruguay to engage with the board to ensure that Uruguay continues to respect and implement the treaties to which it is a party, Yans said plaintively. 78-year-old President Jose Mujica, who campaigned for the law, said he wants the government to start selling marijuana next year. The INCB claims that Uruguay didn't consider the addictive and health implications of cannabis legalization and rejected President Mujica's statement that the move was focused on reducing crime. Yans claimed that the decision will not protect young people, but rather have the perverse effect of encouraging early experimentation, lowering the age of first cannabis use and thus contributing to developmental problems and earlier onset of addiction and other disorders. President Mujica, though, pushed for the change. He mounted a public relations blitz in the face of widespread public opposition to legalization. Polls taken last year, as a matter of fact, showed up to two-thirds of Uruguayans opposed legalizing marijuana. But President Mujica said the government can do a better job than it has been doing by using the police force to violently suppress cannabis. Uruguay's drug agency has four months until mid-April to draft rules for the state-controlled cannabis market. Everyone involved must be licensed and registered, with the government enforcing a 40 gram per month limit 
for adults who buy at pharmacies. License holders will also be allowed to grow up to six plants at home. In the United States this week, a big change and a very significant change, both medically and politically, in the U.S. American Herbal Pharmacopeia. Experts have issued standards on cannabis and restored its classification as a botanical medicine. The American Herbal Pharmacopeia, AHP, in a historic move on Wednesday released the first installation of a two-part cannabis monograph that classifies cannabis as a botanical medicine alongside many other widely accepted complementary and alternative medicines. Written and reviewed by the world's leading experts, the Cannabis Monograph brings together an authoritative compendium of scientific data, including a long await of standards for the plant's identity, purity, quality, and botanical properties. The Monograph provides a foundation for healthcare professionals to integrate cannabis therapy into their practices on the basis of a full scientific understanding of the plant, its constituent components, and its biological effects. The inclusion of cannabis in the American Herbal Pharmacopoeia returns the plant to its place alongside other herbs as a proven botanical medicine, which has been used for centuries by countries and cultures around the world, according to Steph Scherer, Executive Director of Americans for Safe Access, which helps support the development of the cannabis monograph. Healthcare professionals, researchers, and regulators now have the tools to develop effective public health programs for medical marijuana and to further explore its therapeutic benefits, according to Sharon. The first cannabis monograph was introduced in the third edition of the U.S. Pharmacopeia back in 1851, and it remained there until the twelfth edition in 1942, making the AHP monograph the first of its kind in more than 70 years. Cannabis medicines were produced by Eli Lilly and other American pharmaceutical companies until the Federal Marijuana Tax Act of 1937 sharply reduced U.S. cannabis production and prescriptions. AHP began development of a cannabis monograph in 2011, in part because of a need for validated standards to guide laboratory analysis for quality control of cannabis and related products. However, AHP also recognized that the expanding use of medical marijuana makes accurate information regarding appropriate use and safety important for healthcare decisions. Patients, providers, and regulators will also benefit from proven testing standards that can quantify the key chemical compounds or cannabinoids that are tied to the plant's therapeutic effects, as well as identifying potentially harmful pesticides, metals, and microbes. This cannabis monograph was reviewed by the world's leading researchers and represents one of the most comprehensive and critically reviewed documents on cannabis in recent times. Much of the information was developed in collaboration with researchers at the University of Mississippi under the guidance of Dr. Mahmoud El Soli, who oversees the only federally legal source of medical marijuana in the United States. The Therapeutic Compendium, which will be the second installment of the cannabis monograph due out this spring, will document the thousands of years of therapeutic cannabis use around the world and describe the totality of modern research on how cannabis directly treats a broad range of conditions and symptoms. It will encompass historical data, preclinical and clinical pharmacology, indications, contraindications, side effects, dosing, preparations, safety, use in pregnancy, and interactions with conventional medications, among other fields of information. The adoption of cannabis into the American Herbal Pharmacopoeia as a safe, effective, and low-cost botanical medicine is a testament to this human-plant relationship and a significant footprint on the trail towards acknowledgement as such by a much broader audience, according to Dr. Michelle Sexton, one of the authors and reviewers of the cannabis monograph, who is a naturopathic doctor. Dr. Sexton is currently the medical research director at the Center for the Study of Cannabis and Social Policy. AHP was formed in 1995 to promote the responsible use of herbal products and herbal medicines, and it is a worldwide network of botanists, chemists, herbalists, medical doctors, pharmacists, pharmacologists, and other experts in medicinal plants. In New York this week, we have a marijuana legalization bill introduced in the state Senate. New York State Senator Liz Kruger on Wednesday introduced a bill to tax and regulate marijuana for adult use. The bill would end the criminalization of adults 18 years and older who possess up to two ounces of marijuana 
and would create a regulatory system allowing for the retail sale of marijuana to those over 21, much like the current system for regulating alcohol. Recent polls show a majority of Americans and New Yorkers now support taxing and regulating marijuana. New York's current marijuana policies are widely recognized as broken. About 600,000 people, mostly young black and Latino men, have been arrested for marijuana possession in the state since 1997, saddling them with criminal records that impede their ability to obtain jobs, student loans, and housing. Prohibition of marijuana is a policy that just hasn't worked, no matter how you look at it. And it's time to have an honest conversation about what we should do next, Senator Kruger said. The illegal marijuana economy is alive and well, and our unjust laws are branding nonviolent New Yorkers, especially young adults, as criminals, creating a vicious cycle that ruins lives and needlessly wastes taxpayer dollars. Worst of all, this system has resulted in a civil rights disaster, according to Senator Kruger. African Americans are dramatically more likely to be arrested for pot possession than whites, despite similar rates of marijuana use among both groups. In New York City, marijuana possession is the number one arrest, and New York makes more marijuana arrests than every other state in the country, including California, Florida, and Texas. Nearly 97% of all marijuana arrests in New York were for mere possession. The vast majority of those arrested, 85%, are black and Latino, mostly young men. Even though numerous government studies report that young white men use marijuana at higher rates. As a neuropsychopharmacologist who has spent the past 15 years studying the neurophysiological, psychological, and behavioral effects of marijuana, I can tell you that the claims about the harms associated with marijuana use have been greatly exaggerated in the media, said Dr. Carl Hart, Associate Professor of Psychology at Columbia University. Far greater harm results from arresting people for marijuana possession and the racial disparities of those arrests, according to Dr. Hart. Recent estimates show that New York State spends about $675 million a year enforcing marijuana possession laws. Fixing New York's marijuana laws would save hundreds of millions of dollars every year. And these, this money could be invested into the community, increasing the quality of life for all New Yorkers. By enacting a regulatory framework, the state could capture tax revenue that is currently largely under the control of criminal enterprises. Being arrested for marijuana possession isn't a mere inconvenience, according to Alfredo Carrasquillo, the civil rights organizer for the group Vocal. It can have long-lasting consequences for employment, housing, child custody, and other areas of a person's life. These arrests have led to hundreds of millions of dollars in policing and court costs and incalculable damage to the lives of hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers, mostly black or Latino youth. We need real reform now, Carrasquillo said. My 26 years in law enforcement, including 14 in narcotics, taught me that prohibition is the true cause of much of the personal and community damage that has historically been attributed to drug use, said Jack Cole, a retired detective lieutenant with the New Jersey State Police and co-founder of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, LEAP. In a regulated and controlled environment, marijuana will be safer for adult use and less accessible to young people. We can curtail the crime associated with the illicit market and law enforcement can focus its resources on more serious crimes, according to Cole. Fixing New York's marijuana laws will provide compassion and relieve suffering and unnecessary arrests, reduce racial disparities, and free up law enforcement time and resources, according to Gabriel Sayeg, state director of the Drug Policy Alliance. But we need to do more to address the legacy of racial bias associated with current marijuana laws, including erasing marijuana arrests from the criminal records of more than 600,000 New Yorkers arrested for marijuana possession in the past 15 years, and ensuring these same communities can meaningfully participate in and benefit from any legal marijuana-related industry, according to CA. We've tried marijuana prohibition for decades, and it's clearly failed, said Ethan Nadelman, Executive Director for the Drug Policy Alliance. It hasn't reduced use, and instead it has resulted in the criminalization of thousands, gross racial disparities, and enormous fiscal waste. We need to rethink how we can enhance the health and safety of all New Yorkers through sensible reforms. Tackling these issues will require a vigorous, informed debate. 
and Senator Kruger's bill offers a good starting place for these discussions. In Colorado this week, as they implement Amendment 64 cannabis legalization in the Mile High State, they have encountered a couple of road bumps. One of them was whether it's legal to smoke marijuana on your front porch. The Denver City Council at first said it wasn't. Now they say it is. On Monday, the City Council overwhelmingly approved allowing adults to smoke marijuana on their front porches on private property, even if it's in clear public view. In a 10 to 3 final vote, the council approved a measure eliminating the controversial front, port, front yard cannabis smoking ban introduced last month, which had previously appeared poised to pass. Fortunately, common sense ultimately prevailed, said Mason DeVert, a key supporter of Amendment 64, which legalized marijuana in Colorado. If adults are able to consume alcohol and even smoke cigarettes outside on their own property, there's no logical reason why they should be prohibited from using a less harmful substance, said Tvert, who is communications director for the Marijuana Policy Project. City officials need to move on and focus their time and attention on getting the necessary regulations in place to ensure these businesses are able to open on January 1st, according to Tvert. There is no need for further proposals designed to prevent adults from being able to use marijuana responsibly. A widely reviled first draft of the law would have banned even the smell of marijuana or the sight of someone smoking marijuana if it could be smelled or seen by anyone else. I just don't think it should be wrong for someone to smoke on their own private property, City Councilman Paul D. Lopez said. Denver Mayor Michael Hancock's office earlier on Monday had announced the launch of a new website www.marijuanainfodenver.org to keep citizens informed about new cannabis ordinances and regulations as they evolve. Speaking of public use of marijuana in newly legal states, in Washington state where legalization measure I-502 is being implemented, this week the Seattle City Council, a committee within the council, approved a $27 fine for smoking marijuana in public. So smoking marijuana in public is still against the law in Washington state, even under I-502, but it's not going to cost you very much, at least in Seattle. Seattle City Council members in that Wednesday committee vote approved a $27 fine for public cannabis smoking, and the full council is expected to approve the action on Monday. City Attorney Pete Holmes had at first suggested a $50 fine. When administrative fees were added to that, the total cost of a public pot smoking fine could have reached $103. The lower fines, sponsored by council member Nick Lakata, were meant to match the penalty for illegally drinking alcohol in public. The council asked that Seattle Police Department officers give people a warning before fining them for smoking marijuana in public. The ordinance would also require that police log the age, race, and gender of everyone fined for smoking pot in public and the locations of these violations. Police will be required to report these findings every six months. The five council members who are also members of the Housing, Human Services, Health and Culture Committee, that is Nick Lakata, Sally Bagshaw, Tim Burgess, Sally Clark and Bruce Harrell, voted unanimously for the fine. The ordinance leaves it to the Seattle Municipal Court to decide the total cost of fines after administrative costs. The law would allow the court to tack on up to $28 in additional fines for a total of $55. I fully support this, City Attorney Holmes said. Holmes has in the past emphasized that it is in the interest of marijuana legalization to ban public pot smoking. We have an interesting scientific study this week, Harvard University study, that marijuana doesn't cause schizophrenia. Now, claims of a causal link between marijuana use and the development of schizophrenia have been some of the literal reefer madness claims that have been hardest to extinguish, partly because of insistent coverage in the British tabloid press, which actually led the Brits to recriminalize cannabis after briefly relaxing their laws. But yet another study, this one from the Harvard Medical School, has found no association between smoking cannabis and going crazy. Harvard researchers compared families with a history of schizophrenia to those without. 
The results of the current study suggest that having an increased familial morbid risk for schizophrenia may be the underlying basis for schizophrenia in cannabis users and not cannabis use by itself, the researchers found. According to the study, it is the first that examines both non-psychotic cannabis users and non-cannabis user controls as two additional independent samples, enabling the examination of whether the risk for schizophrenia is increased in family members of cannabis users who develop schizophrenia compared with cannabis users who do not, and also whether that morbid risk is similar or different from that in family members of schizophrenia patients who never used cannabis. While some researchers have in the past suggested that there could be a correlation between teenage cannabis use and the increased likelihood of being diagnosed with schizophrenia later, rates of schizophrenia in the general population haven't increased along with the explosion of marijuana use in popular culture. Researchers at Harvard Medical School and the VA Boston Healthcare System looked into whether family risk for schizophrenia is a crucial factor underlying the supposed association between the development of schizophrenia in pot smoking teens. The scientists recruited 282 subjects from the Boston, New York metro areas and they divided them into four groups. First, controls with no lifetime history of psychotic illness, cannabis use, or any other drug use. Second group, controls with no lifetime history of psychotic illness and a history of heavy cannabis use during adolescence, but no other drug use. Third group, patients with no lifetime history of cannabis use or any other drug and less than 10 years of being ill. And fourth and final group, patients with a history of heavy cannabis use and no other drug use during adolescence and prior to the onset of psychosis. Information was gathered about all first, second, and third degree relatives as well as any other relative who had a known psychiatric illness, resulting in information on 1,168 first degree relatives and a total of 4,291 relatives. The study collected information on marijuana use along with family history regarding schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, and drug abuse. Researchers concluded that the results of the new study, both when analyzed using morbid risk and family frequency calculations, suggest that having an increased familial risk for schizophrenia is the underlying basis for schizophrenia in these samples, not the cannabis use. While cannabis may have an effect on the age of onset of schizophrenia, it is unlikely to be the cause of the illness, wrote the researchers, led by Ashley C. Prohl of Harvard Medical School. That study was published this month in the journal Schizophrenia Research. We have a couple of must-read stories that you should check out before we go this week. The first one is called The Undergreen Railroad, Helping Marijuana Refugees Find Freedom, and you can find it on TokeSignals.com. It covers a new nonprofit organization called The Undergreen Railroad, which is formed to help marijuana refugees relocate from states with unfriendly cannabis laws to more compassionate states. It's a great idea, and you can find out all about it on TokeSignals.com. The other must-read story this week Studies Spanning 12 Years, Medical Cannabis Works. This covers a historic experiment in medical marijuana research spanning a dozen years, which brought new science to the debate on the place of cannabis in medicine. And it found that the herb offers broad benefits for pain control from injuries, HIV, strokes, and other conditions. This comes from the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research, which was established and funded to the tune of $8.7 million by the California legislature to answer the question of mar whether marijuana has any therapeutic value. They've all but completed the studies now involving more than 300 patients and the final data are being analyzed. You can check that out on TokeSignals.com, studies spanning 12 years, medical cannabis works. We're going to take a couple of weeks off for the holidays and I will see you the first week of 2014. Until then, I think it would be a great idea to stay lifted. <laughs>